Neosensory's mission is focused on sending data stream to the brain delivered through sound to touch products. In today's episode, we discuss a new research article that sheds lights on this mission through an improvement in tenderness and speech understanding. I'm here today with two individuals from Neosensory, uh, Dr. David Eagerman and Dr. Izzy Kohler. Thank you both for being here. And let's just dive into uh, some studies that you guys have uh, published. One of the most recent ones was in the Washington Post, where we, uh, you were all tested a uh, product of yours for tinnitus. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the study design? Uh, and then we'll get into a little bit of the, the dynamics of what those results are and then the clinical application, if you don't mind. Like. Sure. I'll start off with uh, talking about what it is we're doing with tinnitus, and then Izzy, you can talk about the actual study. So just for clarity, what we have is this wristband that we've built uh, and has vibratory motors on it. And what we're doing for tinnitus is bimodal stimulation. So that means sound plus touch. And that has been shown in a series of studies even before we came along to be very effective in driving down tinnitus. So the way this works is with our app, we play tones, boop, 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 and these are around your tinnitus frequency. And each time a tone is played, you're feeling a corresponding buzz on your skin. And what we have found, and this is what we'll talk about with the study, is that that drives down tinnitus, um, and it's not, you know, it's not a cure, but it drives it down as much as any other version of bimodal stimulation. So for example, this company Lanier does the same idea, but with sound and shocks on the tongue. Our data demonstrate that it can be touched from anywhere. One, there are many interpretations, but one interpretation is simply that you're teaching the brain what is a real external sound, because every time there's an external sound, you're getting verification on your skin, but the tinnitus is fake news and doesn't cause, doesn't get any confirmation and therefore that gets driven down. So we did a study, Izzy, I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so what we did um, as we designed this wristband and what we did to test it out is we designed, we used something called the tinnitus nocturnal index, which as everybody knows is the validated measure for tinnitus. And we used the wristband plus the tones. And then we had a control group that was just tones alone. And simply mm -hmm. what we did is we gave them both, one group did tones alone for eight weeks and one group did the tones plus the wristband for eight weeks. And we gave them both the TFI on a weekly basis. And what we showed by the end of this study is that the group that had the bimodal stimulation, meaning they had the addition of the vibrations, actually did significantly greater on the, on the TFI and saw a tremendous drop in their tinnitus loudness and frequency by the end of the eight weeks. If I remember right, there's also a result that you all found related to the severity of the tinnitus as well. Did I get that right? Yes. That's exactly right. So what we found is, is that those people who had a score of 50 or above at baseline on the TFI, meaning that they had moderate and or, or severe tinnitus, actually saw a much greater drop in the, in the TFI by the end of the study than those that just had, had a minor tinnitus. Which tells us that those people who have had severe tinnitus and have had it for quite a while, it's quite bothersome, actually are able to drop it down to a very mild level, to the point where it's very tolerable on a daily basis. Did you all account for um, the length of tinnitus that somebody might have had? So, is, you know, for example, somebody might say, I've had tinnitus and I've noticed it for five years versus somebody for 25 years. Does that make a difference in how this product is beneficial to that individual? We don't know the answer to that yet, but we are we are collecting that kind of data. And so as we collect more and more subjects through ongoing studies, we will be able to answer that. Sorry, Izzy, okay. were you going to say something else to that? Yeah, something very similar. Um, and in some of our preliminary data, it didn't seem to make a difference. And we did a linear regression and tried to see if there was a trend. Um, there was minimal, if none, there. One thing I want to add here is that what we find generally is that this works, for example, for people with severe tinnitus, 91% of people showed an improvement uh, on the TFI, but we don't yet know exactly who that other 9% is. And this is where our research is aiming now is, as we know, there are many etiologies for tinnitus, 
This works great for most people and some it doesn't. So we're trying to clarify, you know, where does it not work so well? For whom is it people with, you know, acoustic neuromas or something, for example? Uh, and that way we'll be able to know exactly where this uh, play is the best. Yeah, and, and from a clinical standpoint, because uh, you know a large majority of our audience is going to be from the clinical uh, segment, the question becomes: what, How do they now become a player in this process for your product? Can you guys so, share some information on that? Yeah, so we've actually we have through the his, for the short history of our company so far, we've been selling direct to consumer, but just recently. We are really moving to sell to audiology clinics and ENT clinics, and and that's pretty uh, wonderful for us because um, a number of audiologists we've noticed have learned about Neosensory because of their patients who have come to them and told them, and so they've reached out to us. Now we're doing more reach out, and it's uh, spinning up uh, as a very fast flywheel. But the idea is um, we the wristbands go to the audiologist's office. They can, when they have a patient with tinnitus, take care of that right then by saying, look, here's this bimodal stimulation technique, you know, scientifically validated, proven in the literature. And again, this bimodal stimulation goes back at least about 10 or 12 years in the literature, not ours, but other groups. And um, and so they can say, look, here's something that you can purchase right now and go home with it. Oh, and I, and I think that's really, really critical. And from what I'm understanding, there's not a training mechanism that goes with this. It's, is that correct? So, so here's what it is. Uh, each day there's a, well, we call it a trading program, but each day for 10 minutes, you sit down with the app and uh, the app plays the tones and you uh, feel the things. And yeah, you can read or do whatever, relax during that time. Um, but it is, we've gotten this down to like 10 minutes a day. And when I say we've got it down, what I mean is we study different time periods of how long people should use it a day. And, and you get the same benefit out of 10 minutes as you do out of longer. So that's about the shortest you can do. Well, that's it. That's really, really cool. And then most recently, there's another study that uh, you all have just completed that's looking at speech comprehension. And this is with individuals with and without devices, hearing aids, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a little bit about that study? Yeah, that's right. So it's using exactly the same hardware platform, which is to say this uh, device with a microphone and these vibratory motors, but now it's running a completely different algorithm. What it's doing now is for patients with high frequency hearing loss, it is listening in real time for high frequency phonemes. So it's using our homebrewed AI to listen for S and T and V and C and things like that. And it buzzes in different ways to tell you, oh, I just heard an S. Oh, I heard a T and so on. And so with high frequency hearing loss, typically uh, a person still hear their ears are doing fine at the medium and low frequencies. This now clarifies what is happening at the high frequency. That's why we call it the clarify, the neocentric clarify. And, um, and so we have developed that over the course of years and we keep improving the software on it and the ability to detect that including, by the way, in noise. You could be at a, a loud restaurant, there's music playing, there's forks dropping, there's chairs scraping, but it's not hearing any of that. It's only picking up on phonemes, on high-frequency phonemes that are being heard in the environment. And so uh, we ran uh, these uh, studies on it. And so, Izzy, if you want to tell about the study. So for this study, um, what we did is we just took this preliminary, preliminary group um, and we used the eight for this particular study. And what we did was we had them, we did an onboarding call with them, and then we had them use the wristband for at least, we told them at least two hours a day, but most of them got up to about five or six hours a day of speech exposure, just to normal daily activities. Um, and then we made sure that at least one hour that was some kind of focus activity, like watching television or engaged in a conversation, listening to a podcast, something along those lines that they were really engaged and really wanted to understand what was being said. So that was so, sort of a formal practice just to make sure they got that minimal hours of practice. And then we had them take the AFAB on a weekly basis. Um, and what we showed at the end of this is that there was a significant drop in the AFAB. And we did a lot of follow-up interviews at the end of <clears throat> of the six weeks. And a lot of people subjectively did tell us that, oh, yeah, you know, I can listen to the television. I don't have to use closed captions. Um, you know, I can hear my spouse across the table so much better now. 
you know, for a while my spouse was very soft spoken and mumbled and now I feel like I can understand her. So um, we got some really great results with this study and we're very excited to, to write this up um, with the idea that there's more coming. We're certainly doing further research studies to further expand on on what um, clarifies people are doing. Just as a quick example of that, one of the things we're looking at is when it detects a phoneme like a T or an S or whatever, does it just buzz a single motor or does it do some pattern like, you know, the S pattern, or the T pattern, things like that? What is easier for people to learn on? Things like this, um, as well as the next thing we're working on now is the control group um, for this. Yeah. And, 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 and David, what's really, really interesting to me about this, you know, one of the uh, one of the uh, the main issues with hearing aids is the fact that you have to deal with this medium called space. And you've got sound bouncing around, you've got this noise, and, in, and as you pointed out, the the wristband does is not affected by that. So even though my auditory system, which is distorted, is now also getting a distorted system because of the environment, you are now providing additional information that hopefully clarifies, as you pointed out with the name of your product, the ability of that person's uh, performance to go up. And I'm assuming that happens pretty instantaneously. Is that correct? Uh, it doesn't. So one has to, one's brain has to learn how to fuse these two signals. So what you can do is cognitively say, oh, wait, that buzz, that must be a T. So you must have said tap instead of sap. Fine. Oh, okay. But in order for people to really just have it be like an ear, that takes time. So we track this through time. Uh, for example, Izzy mentioned this new study we have coming out was just you know measuring people's AFAB scores, their subjective impression of how easy it was to understand conversation through time. And you just get this this uh, improvement that that moves, but it takes. Um, I mean, we think it takes at least four to six weeks for people to just feel like it's a part of them, such that when they have the band on, they just hear and understand what the conversation is, and when they have the band off, they feel like they have a harder time understanding what the conversation is. But the interesting part is it's all unconscious. The way that with your ears, you don't think about oh, Eagleman saying some medium frequencies now and some high and some low and whatever you just you just feel like you hear me it's the same thing after some number of weeks people just feel like they're hearing the conversation well that's really interesting and does it matter that i know this is going to come up in a, in a conversation does it matter what type of hearing aid the person is using i'm going to assume the answer is no but did you find anything so here, here's what we did we looked at do they are, are they wearing no hearing aids versus hearing aids? And we found there's a difference, which is to say, if you're not wearing any hearing aids at all, you get this big boost in clarity from the wristband. If you already are wearing hearing aids, you also get a boost, but it's not as large. Not surprisingly, because the hearing aid's doing its job as much as it can. And so there is a boost on top of the hearing aid, but it's not as big a thing as you get without hearing aids. To my knowledge, is it correct if I'm wrong, but we haven't compared types of hearing aids against one of one another at this moment. No. Yeah. So we haven't actually collected data on the types of hearing aids. Um, and then you also have to look at fit and other nuances too. Um, but we are currently looking at that to see how the interaction between the hearing aids and the wristband actually occurs, because that's going to be a big thing to consider. So and ask us again in six months, we'll have a better answer. <laughs> Well, it, it, and the reason I'm bringing it up is, as you know, about signal processing changes, and some of these are fast acting versus slow acting, and it changes the, the voice and patterns and the things that you guys are doing. So it'd be really, really interesting, uh, you know, to figure out is this type of signal processing better correlated with an outcome than this type of signal processing? Yeah, cool. Well, as we collect that data, we'll have a clearer picture on that. All right. Well, thank you both for coming on. I think what you guys are doing is absolutely fascinating. Uh, as when I was a doc student, I studied with a guy by the name of um, uh, Brad Rager, and we did some of these things where we would stimulate the tongue to see how people would actually perceive different sounds. This was about 20 or 25 years ago. I don't remember what the outcome was, but I remember it was someone else's dissertation, but I got to participate. And I just remember it was absolutely fascinating. So the stuff that you do brings me back a little bit. Although, um, you know, it's not necessarily my area, but it is really, really cool. And I think it's it's nice to have another option in your tool belt, given the fact that 
you know, people are going to react to sensory information in different ways. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, as you know, I think my my view on the brain as a neuroscientist is, you know, the brain is locked in silence and darkness. It gets all this input, but it doesn't know where that input is coming from. It just knows whether it is useful information for operating the outside world. And so if we push the information into the brain via an unusual channel, it is able to figure that out and do the right things with that info. Yeah. Really, really cool. We look forward to having you guys back on uh, as you continue to collect data and as you continue your journey uh, in this uh, in this web. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, we look forward to the next time that uh, we have you all on. Great. Thanks for having us here. Thank you.